Let's kick it. Hello and welcome to what's new in 2202. First things first, what type of build is this? Some people think it's the first Whistler build and other people who read the desktop string down here in the corner think it's a post-RTM build of Windows 2000. Primarily because there's no mention of Whistler or XP or Windows 2001 anywhere. But that's not strictly the case. There is one mention but it's not any way you'd expect to see it. It's not an NTOS kernel, kernel 32, NTDLL, user 32 or even Win32K. Have a little guess what you think it might be. WordPad? Whoa, I am impressed. Let's just have a look. Impressed at how wrong you are. No, it's not in WordPad, but it is a little bit out of the way. First you have to install a printer. Let me just change that because I've already installed the publisher one earlier. Then you go to right click on properties, sharing, and here where it says drivers for different versions of Windows, click the additional drivers button, and there it is, Windows 2001. Now as you can see, AXP64 is listed as one of the environments, but Microsoft dropped support for Alpha during the Windows 2000 beta, so that's strange why that's there. You can try install the drivers, they don't work. Another thing you can enable in this build that people don't think exists until later on are the lane buttons. Now you're probably thinking, what's the lane button? Well, remember in some of the other builds where it says comment in the title bar, you can click on it and it brings up the bug form. Yeah, well, they're the lane buttons. So first you have to go to Reg Edit and open up HK Current User Control Panel Desktop. Then, oh, mouse is acting up there. You have to add a new D word value. It's called Lame Button Enabled. And give that a non zero value. You can also customize the text if you add a string value and call that surprisingly Lame Button Text. A nice salutation in there. Then you have to log off so Win32K can read it from the registry. Uh, my name's not Bob by the way, it's just what I use because it's shorter to type. And there we go. Oh, hang on a minute, where is it? It's not in the title bar. For some reason in this build when you enable them, they only appear on pop-up windows and not overlapped windows, so you have to go to properties to see it. You can click on it all you like, it doesn't enable anything, they don't work. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, that's fine and all, but is there anything actually new in this build? And the answer is, yes, there is. In System32 here, there's a component that rather nebulously calls itself the Resource Manager. It comes in two components, the kernel mode component that calls itself the Resaw Manager, so it tells you not to go back to the gym after you've hurt yourself there once, and the User Mode component, which does actually put a C in it, and calls itself the Resource Manager, User Mode. Now strangely for components new to Windows, they're used straight away. The kernel mode component is used by Win32K and the user mode component is used by Quartz which is the direct show runtime. Now I looked at the disassembly t of these things to figure out what exactly they did and I came up with nothing. I couldn't figure out what they did. So I put the function names into Google and poof I found the patent for them. Now the date on this patent is 2nd of May 2000 now that's three months, almost to the date, after this build of Whistler, which is dated the 3rd of February. Oop, the date's on the other tab, isn't it? There we go. 3rd of February 2000. So yeah, either they've been sitting on this for three months, or they just forgot to do it to get around to doing it. Now it's quite a long pattern, it describes what it does, it seems like a well-meaning piece of code, but I still couldn't figure out what it did. And at the bottom here, there's a description of the interface of some of the functions it exports. Now it says it's an exemplary API, but I figured out, well, why would they make up a new, why would they make up new interfaces rather than just describing the one they already had? So I tried translating it to the user mode version and indeed they are different, so you can't really use this to use the, the component. One thing I did notice the user mode component doing was leaking the critical section in its DLL main function. Now I know this is an alpha piece of software and as such isn't meant to be completely bug free. But it's weird that they didn't clean up the critical section in the unload notifications you get through the same function. 
Now maybe just this DLL wasn't designed to be unloaded and as such it's not really a problem. They also export the DLL main function as rmu init DLL, which is something the other modules in this build have been stopping doing by removing that from the exports because it's not meant to be called by the users, it's meant to be called by the operating system. As you can see here it doesn't invoke delete critical section at all, so that is leaked. The kernel mode component also has its own mystery, but it's not about leaking anything, it's about from where it was built. If you look at one of the strings embedded in the disassembly, it was built in the NTC2 folder on the S drive. Now if you've installed Neptune and looked at the Winver, you'll see it says build 5550 NTC. Now people think NTC stands for Neptune Client, which makes sense, but I can't prove it is proof either way. So NTC2, hmm, it's a bit of a mystery. But if we look at this, the Neptune version of the resource manager, because it was actually in Neptune, then we see that the build string is a bit different. It says ENTC, so it's on the E drive in the NTC folder. So, you know, maybe they just copied the folder and put a 2 after it, which is one way of making it unique, isn't it? So we think, okay, they just copied one folder over. But if we actually run a findstra on all the files that make up Whistler 2202, or the DLLs in System32 anyway, we can see there's actually quite a lot of them which have that string embedded in them. So, was Whistler 2202 originally in Neptune 2? Who knows? Away from the resource manager and its mysteries, there's also some oddities going on with the resources of the accessibility components. And by resources, I mean the executable resources, not anything to do with the resource manager. So we open narrator here, and I've muted him so you can't hear him. The best volume to have him at. We open it, we see sensory software's URL has been truncated. It just ends with .k instead of .com. But if we open up Windows 2000's version, it's also been muted. In here, it's perfectly fine. So what's been going on here? Well, by the magic of magic, if we open it up in a, a viewer, which c we can see the binary of it. This is my app, which I wrote myself, so you ought to find it on the internet. If we go to the binary, and try and find sensory software's URL. There it is. We see that somebody's put a space, some spaces in after the C. Now, the 20 is a space, and OA is a new line. So somebody's changed the resources to add space and a new line in there. The OM with .com is still there, but it's on the next line down, and the controller hasn't been sized big enough for you to see it, but it's still there. So yeah, that's strange. There's another one, which is in Aquiz, which I can't get to show in the UI because I don't know how to trigger it, but it exists in the resources. And Aquiz is the accessibility wizard. If we go to 95, look, now in Windows 2000's version of this resource, if there's a change of menu and you don't like it, it says, if for some reason your display becomes eligible, Press the escape key once. That's fine and dandy. Now if we open up Whistler's version of this resource. Now it says if for some reason your display becomes illegible, press the escape kit E once. Now again somebody's added a space there. And I'm wondering just why would you do that? I mean, it's working fine, this is no other resources that have been changed. So yeah, I don't know why anybody's done that. Another change in the resources of this version occurs in qdv.dll, which is the Quartz DV decoder. If we open up this dialog, both versions, we see they look pretty much identical and exactly the same. But, hiding in the shadows, if we resize this one, ooh, there's a checkbox down there. Now, whoever put that checkbox there forgot to resize the entire dialog for it to fit on. So if we look at this dialog in action, first in Windows 2000, oh, a nice DV encoded video of the middle of Moscow there. Must playing up, come on. There we go. The DV decoder properties, there we see it's housed in an actual bigger dialog, the filler properties. So if we look at Whistler's version of this, oh, come on there, there we go. Doesn't want to leave us. And we open up the same video in Windows Media Player in this version. The properties, and is it going to be there? Yeah, there you go. It fits quite nicely into the 
bottom of the dialog. Existing modules also had functionality changes, such as NTDLL with its interlocked list functions. Now these are interesting because the entire reason for being is to use a processor feature called ConfExchange 8 to enable lockless list management in this case. But Windows 2000, and by extension this build, didn't actually require a CPU which supported this feature. Now in kernel mode, as you can see here, where this functionality also exists, if um, ConfExchange 8 doesn't exist on the CPU, then the functions which use it are patched to jump to different functions which do the same thing but don't require the feature. Now in user mode with NTDLL, with it being loaded into every process, runtime patching like this couldn't have been deemed suitable or practical. So how do they get around this? They used the lock, the peb lock. Now this could only be a temporary measure since using one lock to guide both the main process information structure and the not really lockless functions isn't the greatest software design. As we'll see later on, this was indeed a temporary measure, and we'll see how they resolve the situation in a more elegant manner. Now I've talked about additions and changes, and even though Windows is considered a pinnacle of forwards, backwards, every which way but loose words compatibility, this build also removed a bunch of stuff, which had made stuff that previously did work, not work. Now that's mainly from one place, ndis.sys. Now that's the network driver interface specification for people who don't know, and for me who just had to read it off a Google page. As you can see here, all these functions which were removed correspond to version 3 of the interface which is dated from around Windows for Workgroups time. As you can appreciate, that's quite old, so Microsoft junked all that stuff, presumably with the intention of making people upgrade to the new standard which was version 5 as of Windows 2000. That's all that's really odd or noteworthy about this build, and yes I know I did show you a new line in a space. Most of these other changes in this table here are export changes for services which included their service name for some reason. I don't know why they did that, they just did. And they changed back later on for some reason, so... <laughs> and the resource changes are mostly type libraries which were made 88 bytes smaller, as you can see here, three of them, which were. Presumably because the middle compiler was upgraded which spat out smaller type libraries. But yeah, thanks for watching, that's the end of it. If you're still here, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in 2211. Not the year, the next build. Whoa, whoa, hang on, there's some stuff I found after I'd finished shooting this video. Now, as you can see here, I ran a diff over the setup information files on the CD and found out that this is the build where the infamous, 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 that's a word in it, yeah, infamous Mr. Enigma registry key was added. Now, what's Mr. Enigma? Uh, I don't think anybody actually really knows what this is. Apparently, the story out of Microsoft is that it's for a DVD decoding software, some really early DVD decoding software, but I don't buy that because who calls a DVD decoding software Mr. Enigma? I also found out from diffing the driver.inf file which lists all the files in the driver.cab that this build was meant to have some extra files in there, the default.bmp and some other ones which I can't remember because I'm doing this from memory not from the screenshot. And yeah, I looked in the driver.cab and as you can see, because I've shot this now, that they're not actually there, so hmm, strange. So just one more oddity to add to the list with the missing spaces and the new lines. So yeah, that really is the end of it this time. So thank you again for watching. Bye.